Today is my attempt to try and make sense of 10 years in city government. Um, I don't know whether to be pleased or embarrassed about my 10 years in city government or pleased or embarrassed about my reflections on them, but uh, we'll let you decide. Uh, some a quick background. My city is a city of now about 6,500 people. 40% uh, of the homes have been built since 2000, which means that the older the people in the older part of town in many ways feel that their city's been stolen from them by all of these damn furners who've moved in. <laughs> um, the form of government is a weak mayor council uh, mayor form of government. That, what that means, there's five members of the council. The mayor only gets the vote if there's a tie, which only happens if a member of the council is missing or a member of the council refuses to vote. Uh, the mayor's real power lies in the agenda. <laughs> the mayor makes the agenda for the city council meetings, the mayor runs the city council meetings, and in my case I was the only one who understood Robert's rules of order. <laughs> Those are actually really, really powerful for tools, uh, but could always claim to be a weak mayor. The uh, city has nothing at all to do with the, uh, with, the city, with the schools, with the public schools. The public uh, schools are funded out of a combination of local property tax established by the local school district and the state. The state has an equalization formula that uses state income taxes to uh, equalize uh, funds that go to the, st to the schools so that Schools in Park City where um, really rich people come and live for two weeks out of the year and uh, have you know, eight million dollar homes. Uh, so schools in Park City aren't differentially advantaged over schools in Kanash where people have houses worth about twenty thousand uh, dollars. So we, as a city council, we can't even tell the school district where they can put a school. They can, they're, they're completely exempt for, from any zoning rules, as are churches. Uh, so, we have a system in Utah of impact fees, where, which is a, an attempt to figure out marginal cost pricing for development. It's not really marginal cost comes closer to average cost but it's an attempt to move in that direction so when Lom builds a new house in Providence he's going to get charged about uh, three thousand dollars for the effect he's going to have on roads about fifteen hundred dollars for the effect he's going to have on parks um, and then there's a, a, also about two thousand dollars for his effects on the water system and something else for the sewer system and then for uh, we can charge one for fire but the city doesn't have one because we contract our fire services what you have to have is a plan that says here's how we're going to maintain the level of service we have today as the city grows so you have this plan saying here's how we're going to continue uh, to have the same number of acres of parks the same uh, quality of roads, etc., and this is how much it's going to cost, and then we figure out how much that to allocate to, to Lom as he builds his new house. So that's an attempt to uh, allocate so that the people living there don't aren't having to pay all of the costs of new development, which is what most people claim is that the that the existing residents pay the costs of uh, of new development. So having said all that. In a training session with members of city councils and uh, planning commissions, David Church, who is the legal counsel for the Utah League of Cities and Towns, stood up in front of everybody, it was a group larger than this, and he said, you are the people the Bill of Rights was written to protect against. <laughs> and although you know, the Bill of Rights was written to protect against the federal government originally, Dave's exactly right. Uh, because people in local government
can be every bit as tyrannical, as self-serving, as mean-spirited, as anyone at any other level of government. They also may be well-intentioned. They have often no clue what the effects of their policies are going to be, but they are, they engage in rent-seeking as members of city councils and planning commissions and as citizens they try and use the system to make themselves better off often in the guise of the public interest and in state constitutions the public interest is actually has a phrase in many state constitutions health safety and welfare so we can do all kinds of things in the name of health safety and welfare um, so I want to talk for a little bit about the arrogance of local power and the arrogance of local power is real uh, people often ask me well, what's it like to be mayor of a small town and my response was well you know I spent some time as a Mormon bishop which is about like being a parish priest and it's a lot like being a bishop in that you discover all kinds of things about your neighbors you wish you didn't know. <laughs> the difference is when somebody comes to you with a problem when you're a priest or a bishop, they're normally trying to solve it, make their lives better. When, a, when a, somebody comes to the mayor with a problem, they're normally trying to take advantage of their neighbor. I want you to fix that problem. I want you to stop him from building on that property. I want you to stop his kids from doing whatever it is that his kids are doing. Um, get phone calls in the middle of the night. My neighbor's dog is barking. Have you called your neighbor? Well, no, that's not my job. It's your job. <laughs> Have you thought about being responsible for yourself and your neighborhood? Well, no, that's your job. <laughs> um, by the way, call waiting was one of the greatest invent. I mean, you know, the caller ID was one of the world's greatest inventions. <laughs> Before caller ID, I got all kinds of calls from people that didn't happen after <laughs> after caller ID. But <coughs> start with zoning. The thing that city councils and planning commissions do mostly is zoning and here's what zoning does they want they tell you what you can do with your property how far from the street your house can be how far from the side yard the house can be how far from the side yard you can place a building like one that you might buy at Home Depot that you would store your lawnmower in how far from the back property line your house or one of those buildings can be how large the lot can be how small the lot can be how how large a, a front porch you have to be. If you have to have a front porch, does the front porch have to be covered? What, what kind of material do you have to have on the siding of the house? Oh, ju I'm just starting. I'm just getting started. Hang on. <laughs> what, is the, what kind of material do you put on the roof? Does it, have, can it be, uh, does it have to be cedar shingles or can it not be cedar shingles? Does it have to be asphalt? Does it have to be some other, some other system? Uh, does it have, do you have to have curb, gutter, and sidewalk? If you do have to have curb, gutter, and sidewalk, what's the distance between the curb and the, and the sidewalk? If there is that, that distance between the curb and the sidewalk, does it, what does it have to be planted in? Can it, does it have to be grass? Can you have some uh, other organic material? Can, how about rock? And if you can have rock, what's the minimum diameter of the rock? What's the maximum diameter of the rock? Can you plant vegetables out there? How about trees? Are trees mandated? What kinds of trees are mandated? What's, what caliper of tree can you plant? Does it have to be at least an inch, an inch and a half, two inches, two and a half inches? How about the driveway? How wide does the driveway have to be? Does it, can it only be the width of one car and then widen as it gets to the driveway? Does it, can it be as wide as, as, as two cars? Can, can, the, can the, uh, the, the garage doors face the street or do they have to face away from the street so that you come in and around to the side so that the, the, the garage doors don't face the street because garage doors that face the street and, and stick out a little bit from the house, those houses are called snout houses. They look like pigs. They're unattractive. 
So we don't want snout houses in our city, according to many people. So, so how about, can you have the garage door open during the day? Does it have to be closed during the day? Can you have a basketball standard in the, in, in the driveway? Or does it have to be hidden in the backyard? You want me to go on? Uh, these are all things in a planning in a, that, that city councils decide about your house. How about things that you can't see, like the, the plumbing? Can it be copper? Does it have to be copper? Can it be, it, can it be any of the new plastics? What size of, uh, the, does it have to be? Can, do you have to have one inch lines distributed? Can you have three quarter inch, half inch, three eighths inch? Depends on how the city, if the city's trying to control your water supply, the flow of water that's used inside your house. What, what about the appliances? What kinds of appliances are you allowed to have? What about your toilet? What's, what kind of toilets are you allowed to have in your city? A three, four, four different presidential commissions have looked at zoning codes. Their estimates vary between 25% and 50% of the cost of a new home are caused by zoning codes. You say, well, how can this happen? Why do city councils allow this to happen? Why do they, why they accept all of these, these rules that are caused by zoning codes, many of which are plumbing, electrical, um, the building codes establishing the pitch of roofs, et cetera? Well, because it's really easy to accept because you get these, these uh, big books every two years from the uh, National Association of Plumbers and Electricians. And it's just really easy to accept. Well, let's accept the 2008 requirements. Okay, the new 2010 requirements are out. Let's accept them without ever... I mean, who wants to go through this stinking book and decide? It's just so really easy to decide and then you're just empowering your, your inspector to do all of these things. Um, these are just the, the normal, everyday, don't even ask a question really about them decisions that are made by planning commissions and city councils. Then, you start getting phone calls. I got a call from this really nice old guy. He was old. He was about 85, so I, I classify 85 as old. <laughs> um, he lived up on the bench looking out over the valley and there was a lot just below him and the people just below him were building a house and the house was getting higher and it appeared that the roof of that house was going to block part of his view of the valley and he wanted me to stop them. He, had, he wanted me to come up and stand on his deck and look at what was going to happen to his view and stop them. I said, did you check to see if they're going to exceed the maximum height allowed under the building code? He said, no, I didn't check. I said, well, I did. And they're not going to exceed the maximum height allowed by the building code. I said, did you go talk to them to see about possibly purchasing a view easement from them? He said, no, I shouldn't have to do that. It's my view. Is it in your deed? Did the, no, it's not in my deed. Well, how about just talking to them and ask them if they could change their plan a little bit so that you could preserve your view? Oh, they're really nice people and I don't want to alienate them. <laughs> but you could go do it. You could tell them. Now, and this, this was just, he, he was a nice guy and he was, uh, he just wanted me to go solve this problem for him. Uh, and he wasn't, he wasn't really pushy. He didn't show up at city council meeting. But the very first city council meeting that I conducted as mayor, the room was filled. It was packed. And it's, not, it's a room that's not this big, but it was, every seat was taken. People were lining the walls. And I looked around, what the? Um, on the agenda was to approve the, a zone change from agriculture to single family traditional for two pieces of property a 10 acre piece and a 20 acre piece. They had been in, it had been in the master plan. Cities have master plans. <laughs> For 20 years that this land would transition from agriculture to single family traditional, which means that the average lot size would be about uh, between 12 and 14,000 square feet. An acre lot, an acre is 43,500. So, uh, 
minimum a quarter acre lot. Some of them would be larger, but we allowed lot averaging, so some would be smaller. Um, and there were some people in that neighborhood who were furious. They were so agitated, angry. The, the, the property that had to, was a 20 acre piece had, would have, uh, by the time you put in roads, uh, you don't get four lots per acre, so you don't get 80 houses, you would get a, just about 60 houses. May have been 56, but say 60. And a woman who lived across the street on a two acre piece um, stood up and said, this will destroy my life. There will be so many people there. There will be mothers screaming at their children like fishwives. Really? A guy whose property abutted that property talked about sitting on his porch for the last 20 years and watching horses gallop across this field. And how wonderful it was to sit there and watch horses graze and gallop. Actually, he really liked it when I walked down the road with my llamas while we were doing our training hikes because horses and llamas are, horses think llamas are really odd, so the horses would stick their tails in the air and run down to the fence to check out the llamas, and he thought that was just so cool. <laughs> while sitting on his porch. Um, how awful this was going to be. It needed to stay in agriculture. Um, I was fairly surprised at him because he, you know, he'd lived there long enough that he knew the people who owned that property. The people who owned that property, well, first of all, this is the property that were for the previous, you know, until about 1960, nobody lived there who could afford to live anywhere else because the topsoil in that part it, you know, if you there's about this much topsoil, and after that, it's all gravel because it was all the everything that had washed out of the mountains during while well, Lake Bonneville was there. So this all gravel with this just little tiny bit of topsoil on top of it. I mean, it's gravel all the way down, like turtles all the way down. Uh, um, and so it's really poor farm ground, but that's where poor people lived and tried to farm. The people who lived there, the Jensens, were. They were poor. As my father would say, they were so poor they didn't have a pot to piss in. And one of the Jensen sons who now owned the property walked across the property with me and showed me this, he showed me this cistern. I said, Leon, what is this? He said, well, we used to run the irrigation water into here and fill this with water and then there's a pipe that ran down from here to the house. That was their drinking water, was the irrigation water. Uh, and they were doing this well into the, uh, actually into the 70s before they ever hooked up to city water. These were people who were poor. Now the kids had grown, the parents had, uh, had died, the house had fallen down, uh, so the kids had left and had, had made something more of their lives. But These folks were going to tell them, you have to continue to keep that property just as it was when your parents were there and had nothing. And I was, I was angered, angered by this, but I couldn't communicate my anger in any way that, any, that made any sense to anybody. I said, you're stealing from these people. And they could not see it. Um, on the other piece of property, the 10 acre piece, it would, uh, 24 homes would be built on that piece. It backed up to another subdivision, oddly a subdivision that had been built in, in a uh, formerly, uh, what used to had, be an orchard, um, an apple orchard that had actually stopped producing and then instead of being replanted had become a, a subdivision. So one family who's were at a cul-de-sac 
and their house backed against this 10 acre piece. So they, they're against the 10 acre piece. The 10 acre piece is right there in their backyard, completely open. They have this great view of the mountains. And the woman in that house got up and said, you know, I should be more Christian about this. But when it comes to money, I can't be. <laughs> okay. This needs to stay open space. Now, open space is the buzzword. I, yeah, it, was, it hadn't had produced any economic value in at least 50 years. But it had to stay as open space. I said, why don't you buy it? Get your neighbors together and purchase it if you want it to stay as open space. Oh, we can't do that. The guy who loved to have the hor see the horses running across there, I said, Roy. Turns out Roy had been a developer his whole life. I said, Roy, you know how this works. Why don't you buy this? You can develop part of it, leave the rest open, so put some horses out there. You can, you can do this so that it's really nice for you. He, he said, I don't have that kind of money. Roy, they make banks. No, but you just shouldn't allow them to develop. It was, I, the mo it was just, to me, it was just outright attempt at, at theft. Stealing from the Jensen's uh, so that they wouldn't have to hear mothers yelling at their children like fishwives so that they could continue to enjoy seeing horses running with their tails in the air when I walked by with my llamas. Um, another woman who de lives down off the bench in the older part of town has a PhD in economics and every time she stands up in city council meeting she re reminds us that she has a PhD in economics. <laughs> Hi, my name's Linda, I have a PhD in economics. <laughs> and my response is always, but you don't teach in the economics department, do you? She, <laughs> she doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> And she had my opponent's sign in her front yard. I thanked her because I said, you know, you won, you won me more votes by having his sign in your yard. Uh, <laughs> but she wanted to talk about externalities, the externalities of cars coming down past, down her road. Linda, if you've looked at any, you know, any master plan of the city, the zoning plan, you can see that road comes right down to the elementary school. Everybody has assumed that there would be development on this bench and that that's where people would come to bring their kids to school. She said, but it's my road. And they make it, I sometimes have to wait to pull out of my driveway. <laughs> Linda, is it your road? Is it, you know, show me your deed. Which would also make her upset. So then I asked her if she had ever read Ronald Coase about two-way externalities. I said, you know, if you didn't live there, then there wouldn't be an externality, would there? <laughs> See, obviously I wasn't trying to play nice with Linda because there just wasn't any reason to. But she, her argument was, it's your job to protect our property rights. And I said, well, if you don't like what those people are doing with their property, why don't you purchase it? She said, no, it's your job to protect our property rights from them. And she saw, she and the other people there cheered when she said that. They saw no contradiction between them stopping the Jensen's from using their property as they would like and her using zoning laws to, to stop the Jensen's. Um, and it was, it was truly a nasty, um, meeting, as it turned out, one of the members of the council was chicken to vote. It was a 2-2 two -two tie. <laughs> <laughs> and I voted to <laughs> in favor of the rezone. Um, oddly enough, a few weeks later, the council wanted to reconsider that vote, and they so I allowed it back onto the agenda and they reconsidered and voted to change it from single family traditional to single family estate, which reduced the number of homes on the large piece from the 56 or 60 to um, 18. 
reduce the value of the property to a third. And it's okay, the developer let it happen because there is a state law that doesn't allow them to do that. But he just let it happen, let it ride for a while. We then, in an executive session, informed the council that what they'd done was not legal. <laughs> uh, and they had to then rescind what they had done. The great thing is there was a state law that stopped the council from arbitrarily changing that zoning law. Otherwise, the city council would have just been able to be arbitrary entirely. In fact, in Utah, the city, cities are corporations. They're incorporated by the state. They are, they are creatures of the state. And thank goodness for that. Because cities, councils, just, they, are, they have all these great intentions. They want to do good, and do, but they don't have any sort of measure of what doing good is. They just want to do good. And doing good is making other people happy, some people happy. Doing the right thing. Um, one of the ways to do the right thing is not allow granny flats. A granny flat is an addition to your home, and it's an apartment in your home. One that has separate kitchen facilities. It's called a granny flat because it's the place you would move your grandmother while she, when she can no longer take care of herself in her own home, but she's still semi-independent, so you, she can be there in that granny flat and you can check on her easily. The problem with granny flats is that then I might, you know, you're going to get married and you may have children and I might rent that to you. And then you and your children and your husband and you and your husband's cars will be at my house and it will downgrade the neighborhood. So we cannot allow me to have a granny flat because we'll end up with you <laughs> and your children. Huge, I mean, people show up in city council meetings to make that argument. We can't, and the people who wanted granny flats were not, sometimes the grannies, because they wanted to be able to have a little apartment to rent to her as a way of generating enough income that she, the granny could stay in her own house, could, she could afford to stay in her house instead of having to go off to, to downsize and go somewhere else. She'd like to stay where she grew, raised her kids, but she can't afford to unless she has some form of income like renting. Um, I, for eight of the ten years I was in city government, I was on the uh, board of directors of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. I found myself voting, often being the lone vote on is issues that I thought should have been pretty clear. One of them was over whether or not they should request permission from the state legislature to tax cell phones. Yes, ta to tax cell phones. The cities tax landlines. The argument for taxing landlines is that there are some costs to the city of having the landlines, the, the, the telephone poles strung through the city, some issues with trees that might grow up. I mean, there are some, that's, there's some nebulous connection between some costs and the tax. So, but as people are having, getting cell phones, cities are saying, wait a minute, we're going to be losing some money that we had. So they wanted to be able to tax cell phones. And so I'm in this meeting of 80 people from across the state, and they're talking about how great this will be to tax cell phones. And I raised my hand and said, what possible justification is there for taxing cell phones? There's no nexus between any costs they create for us and the tax. And the attorney for Salt Lake City st said, they represent a huge pile of untaxed cash. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one to vote against it. Were any of those phone taxes on the landlines paying for like 911 emergency response? No, this is entirely different tax. <laughs> no, the 911 tax is, is, is different. This is just a, ta a tax because you can. 
Um, Provo City is often viewed as the most conservative city in America. Utah County is often considered to be the most conservative county in America. They all rank about among the top three. So the most, one of the most conservative counties in America, one of the most conservative cities in America, and the mayor of, of Provo um, considered himself to be a truly conservative person. But he didn't think that Provo was getting appropriate service for uh, fiber optic service. And so he wanted to, the right thing to do was for the city to go into business providing uh, internet service. How do you rate conservatism? There are, I don't do the ratings. You know, they're just among, there are people who do the rankings. This would be socially conservative. <laughs> uh, so in this, in this case, it's clearly not economically con con conservative. Um, he managed to talk his city council into creating iProvo, a city-funded, city-created internet provider. They, they built the backbone. They were going to, it was going to be a great success. Year after year, it lost millions of dollars. I asked him how he got into internet socialism. <laughs> uh, they finally sold it because the city council was no longer willing to subsidize it out of their, the rest of their city funds, but they, the sale is only a quasi-sale. They consider, continue to subsidize the company that they sold it to. Um, but he had the best of intentions. The, Mayor of Logan City, city right next to us, uh, Randy Watts. Randy considers himself to be fairly conservative. He's a businessman. He wants to run things like a business. But Randy believes that the, the right thing to do is to recycle. Not only to recycle, but to force others to recycle. And. In our county, we have a county-wide uh, landfill, and the county only allows the county to collect garbage, and the county collects garbage by contracting with Logan City to collect all of the garbage. So I, as a mayor, had no say about, about who collected garbage in my city. We just were expected to collect the money and pass it straight on through to Logan City. So Logan City went to the, city, to the county council and said, we want everybody to recycle, and the reason we want everybody to recycle is we need to extend the life of the landfill because we're running out of space in the landfill. Well, the first thing to remember about landfills is that at best, 25% of what goes into the landfill comes from homes. At best. And only a tiny portion of that really is stuff that can be recycled. And if you want to hear all about it, go to one of the EconTalk... Uh, podcasts and hear Mike talking to Russ Roberts about it. I don't know if this wants to stay on here. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, Four dollars a month will cover the cost of this recycling if every city, if every home in the county is forced to do it. Well, one of the members of this county council, turns out, is an economist, and he actually worked out the numbers. If all of the assumptions made by, about savings of st stuff being recycled and not making it into the landfill were correct, if people switched from using the large garbage cans, the 90 gallons, and went down to the 60 gallon cans that was predicted, it would extend the life of the landfill from 16 years to 17 and a half years. Well, not, it would extend the life 16 months if everything worked as predicted. It would cost $10 million to do that. And when that was pointed out to 
to Mr. Watts. He said, it doesn't matter what it costs. It's the right thing to do. Um, a member of my council reflected that kind of thinking. Uh, he's a, he is such, he's such a nice guy. He's 36-ish, sat right next to me. He uh, works in the LDS Church Seminary System, which is a system of release time for high school kids to get out an hour a day to go, run a, go across the road for religious instruction. And uh, Dave would lean over to me and uh, something would be proposed and he'd say, he'd lean over and say, will this be a blessing for Providence? Will this be a blessing for Providence? I said, Dave, that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, will this make people more free or less free? Will this increase choice or decrease choice? There isn't a Providence, there are people. Um, I don't think he ever understood, but it's the, will this bless us? Was this the right thing to do? Um, which really does sort of summarize I don't think most of the people involved in local government are really venal. Some of them are. Some of them just truly are. They are... Linda's evil. <laughs> I told her she was evil. She was so offended. <laughs> she said I was evil! Um, but I think that most people in city government follow what I would call a feel-good test. <laughs> Three parts to the test. One is, do I have good intentions? <laughs> think about Barney Frank, maybe. <laughs> do I have good intentions? The second is, will I make somebody happy? <laughs> Preferably those who show up in city council meetings and complain, not those who don't show up. And will I feel good? Notice that those are all, none of those have anything to do with making people more free or less free, more choice, less choice. But that's the only way I can explain some of the, you know, I provo, recycling. Um, I am so glad that there are federal and state rules that control all of this feel-good stuff that goes on in local governments. Otherwise, feeling doing the right thing would be completely out of control because there's an arrogance to feeling good, an arrogance to doing the right thing. I know what the right thing is to do. I know what's right for you and for you and for you and you should do it because I have the power to make you. I know what tree you should plant in front of your house. I know what siding you should have on the side of your house. I know how close you should be putting a building to your back property line. I know what size of sign you should be able to have in your front yard if you have an internet business inside your house. I know whether or not you can build a snout house or a house with the, with the garage doors on the side. I know all these things because I'm elected by the people <laughs> and because I'm doing good. It really, really frightens me. I, I can't go to city council meetings <laughs> without being in charge. <laughs> it just is, <laughs> it is really too frightening. Now I want to talk about something entirely different, something else that I saw that is completely informal as opposed to the formal government. And it's spontaneous, it's informal, it emerges, it might be considered governance as opposed to government. Um, one of the first examples I saw was a woman who has all kinds of excess energy. Uh, it's a good thing she doesn't drink caffeine. 
But she went around to our neighborhood and said, look, we all give each other these little neighborhood Christmas presents, right? We don't need Christmas presents from each other. It's kind of silly. We just do it because we like each other. How about you all give me what you would have spent for the neighborhood Christmas presents and I will go give that money to Sub for Santa. She put together Christmas for 50 families just by organizing her neighborhood. Nobody had to vote. It was all voluntary. Adele just went door to door and said, here's an idea. 50 families. I had a, an acquaintance in the English department who, uh, his name is um, Ken. And Ken was, um, a great poet. He was the named the poet laureate for the state of Utah by the governor. He he got divorced, got remarried, said the divorce didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> and he was dying of an incurable cancer and he moved into one of the neighborhoods in my city. And he didn't know anybody. He had nothing in common with anyone in his neighborhood. And the people in the neighborhood showed up and to talk to him, to meet him, to see if he needed anything. He had his own friends. He had hospice care. He was dying and he knew it and he was at peace with it. And he said, I really don't need anything. I don't want to be part of your neighborhood. I'm fine. Well, it was winter. And it was a winter that snowed a fair amount. And it was in, in a February that winter, I stopped by his house to see how he was. And he was, had a walker and was on oxygen. And I sat and talked with him a bit and asked if he needed anything. He said, no, but he said, could you do a favor for me? I said, what's that? He said, well, will you find out who's cleaning my driveway and sidewalk and thank them? Because they show up every time it snows and they clean my driveway and sidewalk and go away. Nobody voted. Nobody went to the city council and said, would you go use the city plows and the city staff to clean this driveway? You know, he's dying. You should take care of him. They just did it. Monday was Memorial Day on the street, the street that I live on, but it's across a, a, another road. The um, people on that street pulled their cars across the street and blocked it off <laughs> at both ends and brought chairs and tables out into the street and held a neighborhood breakfast. The public works director doesn't like it when they do that. He says, well, what if there's an emergency? They'll move the cars. <laughs> they set up basket, you know, those portable basketball standards on both sides of the road, and kids play basketball back and forth. Um, the neighbors just hold this party in the street. They don't ask permission, they just do it. I have a friend who uh, was a base, continues to be a pretty serious baseball nut. His sons played uh, baseball with mine. Uh, he was concerned that there wasn't really a good place to play ball for kids as they got beyond about 14 or 15. And at the city park, there was this ball field that had been a softball field, but we didn't have a good women's softball program. There's one that's coming. I've been working really hard at getting a good women's softball field. I'm making progress. But I need women like Kurt. Because what Kurt did is he went to the city council and said, look, you've got this field. It's not used very much at all. It's kind of in disuse. If I can raise the money, can I turn that into a first class, full size baseball field? They said, oh, okay. Kurt went out and raised $100,000. Pro 
privately raised $100,000 and turned that into a great baseball field. It is, uh, it's used all the time. It is, it's, it's really a great baseball field. There's now another one in our valley that's as good, but it cost about three times as much to do because it was done by Logan City. <laughs> Um, well, some other parents thought, who had young kids thought, wow, we could do the same kind of thing with the Little League field. So they came and said, can we do the same thing with the Little League field? And they, they raised some money, asked if they could name it after the guy who had given the mo most of the money. And I think they put, put about $40,000 into a Little League field. And wow, they, we held this major tournament there. And I was there. They had the lights on on the field the first night. And they you know, had a barbecue for all of the teams. And this guy and his kid walked up next to the, to the fence. And they're looking at, at it under the lights. And the dad turned to the kid and says, Holy shit. The kid said, It's a field of dreams, Dad. LAUGHTER all done privately. It's on public land. The city owns the park. But it was done, again, spontaneously. Some parents getting together instead of saying, City, you need to do this for us. They said, can we do this for us? Um, this one's a little harder for me to talk about. So, Two years ago, my daughter was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. She's okay now, but um, we were down at her house um, the night before she was going to surgery to make sure that we had things arranged um, to take care of her boys. So Ken could be at the hospital. We, we were going to take care of the boys. We're just sitting there in, uh, at their house talking and neighbors start drifting into the yard. Pickup truck pulls into the driveway. In the back of the, tr the truck was a freezer. Not a very big one. The neighbors had bought a freezer, filled it with food. They picked it up, hauled it into the basement, plugged it in. Things were all labeled. Walked Ken through what was in it. Um, and we went home like this in tears. being amazed at the spontaneity of people in a neighborhood to take care of each other. Um, there's another family uh, who have a home business selling jams and jellies. They have their, they're made somewhere else and then the, shipped to this family. They have their own labels they put on them and they distribute them to stores. They sell them out of their garage. And at Christmas time we go down and buy some cases from them and u use them as Christmas presents. Uh, it was fun to give them while I was mayor because it had the pro Providence on the, you know, I don't remember Providence something on the, the name of the, of the jellies. And on their garage door was this uh, sign with a bunch of flowers, Welcome Home Clarissa. Uh, and so Janet said, so what's, what's the sign about? Is, did Clarissa just come home? We, she didn't know them. I did. And I'm sitting there trying to hush her because Clarissa had died of cancer about three months before. Um, 
and they, they were happy to talk about Clarissa. She was a 10-year-old. Uh, they just had left the sign up. They'd, left, they'd put it there when she came home from the hospital. Um, but they talked about their neighbors. People they didn't even know, showing up with food, stopping them in the grocery store, giving them a hug. Some of these are the same people who throw up at city council meeting and yell, acting entirely differently when they're involved in private action as opposed to public action. Um, One guy who is just one of the crustiest, ornery guys you've ever met, uh, has a booth at the farmer's market, and Clarissa's family has one right next to them, and he was so taken by Clarissa that he had, uh, earlier that year, written a letter to the editor in the local newspaper, you know, that for the whole valley, because, you know, 6,500 people, we don't have a newspaper, but invite, telling people about Clarissa and inviting them to come to his booth and he would give them a tomato plant in memory of Clarissa. We had people come and ask if they could put a bench in the city park in her name. We had people come to the, to the school and ask if they could create a butterfly garden in Clarissa's name. None of this required voting. None of it required getting it, coming to city council and saying, use public money. It was all people just coming and saying, We'd like to do these things. There's a whole bunch of voluntary order, people solving problems without voting. My public choice model, I think, explains all of the nastiness, the arrogance of local power. I think we can I, talk about the difference between government on the one hand and governance, local self-governance, spontaneous order on the other hand. I don't really have the tools to explain all of that self-organizing stuff that I saw. I just know that it deeply moved me, made me appreciate voluntary action far more, and made me wish that we had a lot bigger sphere for it and a lot smaller sphere for the stuff that I saw in city council meetings. Thanks.